Chairman of Decision. Please, Please uh, turn, turn on, on your, your mic microphone by now. Uh, see you, but can't hear you. Oh, really? Uh... Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, no, we hear Yes, no, we hear Can you hear me? Yes, very bad. Yes. You can he can you hear me now? Okay. I understand you can hear me but maybe you can't see me <laughs> hear you uh, hear you very well, uh, but Neil, very well, but great can, can you see my slides yes yes we see you also. okay fine uh, so let me stop the slide so that you can see me you can see me now? Ah, okay. Uh, Byron, your uh, microphone. Uh, Byron, your uh, microphone. You should turn on it uh, yourself. You should turn on it. It's uh, your side. Oh, can you hear me now? Oh, can you yes. hear me now? Oh, yes, okay, okay, great. great. Oh, okay, okay. Great. Huh. Sorry about this. Huh. Sorry about this. No worries. Now, if you can hear me, I guess now, I can, can introduce Professor Neil Turok. Professor Neil Turok. Okay. Okay. So let us start the session. So let us start the session. Sorry for my mic. Sorry for my uh, mic. Uh, I'm Byron Tiki. Uh, and uh, it's I'm my Byron. great pleasure to introduce you, great Professor Neil Turok, our keynote speaker. Turok, and, he's keynote 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 and he's going to talk about the new about theory of the universe. The new theory and the he's in uh, the Higgs Center for Theoretical Physics in the University of Edinburgh, in the UK, and the Pyramid Institute for Theoretical Physics in Waterloo, Canada. Uh, I think we all know him. Uh, I think we all it is again a great uh, pleasure to have him here. Professor Turok, please. Yes. Professor Turok, please. Okay, thank you very much. Well, it's really my pleasure, and I uh, really want to thank the organizers. Um, you must be working in very diff difficult circumstances, and I think uh, what you're doing is, uh, is really wonderful. Um, and I really wish I was there in person with you, and hope that will be possible uh, at some time. So congratulations on the conference, and uh, please keep it up. Uh, we, we, we all support you very much. Um, so I'm going to talk about a rather ambitious topic, and you might think I'm crazy, 
to say we need a new theory of the universe. But uh, I have come to this conclusion after uh, many decades of work in uh, more standard uh, pictures. Um, I really came to this point of view about uh, eight years ago when I was director of Perimeter Institute. Um, and I'm happy to tell you that this uh, new point of view is finally coming to fruition. Uh, and you'll see some very exciting papers on it uh, in the near future. So I'm going to start by, I'm going to share my screen. I hope this works. Uh, can you see my slide? Yes, yes, we can see. Yes, yes, we can see. All right, excellent. Okay, so um, this is the topic of my talk. As I said, it's very radical, but uh, it's radical only in a certain sense. It's, uh, it's what you might say radically conservative or radically minimal. Um, I'm going to avoid adding new things to the physics we know. I'm going to stick to the physics we are quite sure of. And try, and I will argue that if with a very, very modest improvement of known physics, we can actually explain everything we see about the universe. Of course, when I say everything, that means a certain set of problems. It doesn't explain uh, many philosophical issues about the universe. Um, this work is largely done with Latham Boyle, who's at the Perimeter Institute, and we have five recent preprints on this. Uh, four of which are now with FizzRev letters being refereed. And, uh, and we have a new one coming out this weekend, which I'm particularly excited about. Um, okay, so why isn't it changing the slide? There we go. So this slide tells you what the current consensus is. This is the most popular model of cosmology. That before the current epoch, of let's say hot big bang uh, followed by uh, matter domination and then lambda domination so before those epochs which are relatively well understood the current consensus was that there was a era of inflation exponential growth of the universe driven by some type of uh, scalar field potential energy and in the current consensus we really have no idea how that arose or what came before it. So if you like, we insert this era of inflation between the singularity and the hot uh, Big Bang. That's what the most common uh, view of cosmology is today. It's extremely popular. There are tens of thousands of papers on different models of inflation. But in my view, the, this theory's shine is now fading and uh, it needs to be replaced. Uh, inflation has played a very important role. It has motivated uh, many observations and allowed people to build models to fit the observations. But it's also very problematic because all we see in the data is a vanilla Lambda CDM model, extremely simple. Um, overall picture of the universe with just five numbers. Uh, three describe the energy content, uh, so that's the uh, baryons, the dark matter, and the uh, cosmological constant or lambda. So just three numbers uh, as well as the radiation. So three numbers describe the energy content and uh, two numbers describe the structure in the universe, the fluctuations on large scales and the power spectrum uh, tilt. And I'll come to this a bit later. So basically five numbers describe everything on large scales in the universe. Whereas in inflation, one has a patchwork of adjustable models, as I mentioned, uh, thousands of models, uh, each one with many parameters. And you can't really say you're predicting anything. Uh, as compared to the data. Secondly, most inflation models predict a multiverse, which is a very chaotic uh, universe, which is still inflating on large scales. 
And there's absolutely no sign of that in the data. On the contrary, the data indicate extreme simplicity on the largest scales we can see. Thirdly, and probably most important, inflation has a smoking gun signal, which is there should be long wavelength gravitational waves created during the inflation epoch. And people have searched for these. There were uh, some false claims made a few years ago, which were then uh, refuted. But uh, right now we see no evidence of long wavelength gravitational waves. For this reason, the simplest model of inflation with a phi squared potential is ruled out. The current bound is that uh, the tensor scalar um, power, power is uh, less than 5%, and this will fall very dramatically over the next uh, four years. It will fall by more than a factor of 10. So inflation, as this bound goes out, inflation becomes less and less uh, credible. So here it is phi squared. The tensor scalar ratio is predicted about 15%. And uh, the current bound is down here at about uh, 3%. Uh, incidentally, I had a bet with Stephen Hawking that the bound would go below 5%. And unfortunately, he didn't uh, survive in order to pay, pay the bet with me. But uh, seriously, the, the, the bound is is falling rapidly. Uh, the anticipated bound, as I mentioned, is going to be less than 0.3 of a percent. Um, so here's the lambda CDM model. This is the this is what observations indicate. As I said, only five numbers: three for the matter or energy content, two for the uh, uh, structure of the universe, the large scale structure as uh, measured by gravity. So we usually uh, define this in terms of the Newtonian potential on large scales, uh, sometimes called the co-moving curvature perturbation also, uh, which is related by uh, a constant factor. And um, here we see for the Newtonian potential, we see a roughly scale invariant uh, RMS amplitude on uh, large scales. Uh, so the amplitude is measured, for example, by the Planck uh, satellite to uh, high accuracy now. And there is a very small uh, red tilt, this number epsilon about 0 0.02, so that as you go to smaller k or larger wavelengths, you get a slightly larger amplitude. And actually this preprint coming out this weekend, um, I hope will give a really nice explanation for that uh, tilt in terms of standard model physics. Uh, many, many quantities are consistent with zero. There's no spatial curvature. There are no um, uh, fluctu uh, isocurvature fluctu fluctuations, which mean fluctuations in the composition of the universe from place to place. Um, and uh, there's no evidence of non-Gaussian fluctuations in the universe. The picture is really amazingly simple. Gaussian random noise with a scale invariant uh, spectrum, uh, apart from this slightly red tilt, as I said, which we think we can now explain. So here's the, the best measurements we have of the large scale structure in the universe made by the Planck satellite, uh, mapped the whole sky and the temperature. And uh, I was very fortunate to get into this game in the 90s when uh, not everything had been predicted. So Jim Peebles won his Nobel Prize essentially for predicting this curve, uh, among other things, but predicting the red curve, which is the temperature power spectrum as a function of multipole on, on the sky. Uh, there are adjustable parameters, but but uh, the five numbers I mentioned before are essentially fit to this data um, and, and that provides a measurement of them. They're then confirmed and the accuracy is improved by using other data sets. Now what we realized in 1994 is that if you fit this data uh, it, it, to the uh, simplest uh, model of the perturbations, then you can predict the correlation between the temperature and the polarization 
which is an independent quantity you can measure in the microwave sky. And so in this curve up here, uh, there are actually no free parameters. Once you fit the data to the lower curve, the upper curve is absolutely predicted. And as you can see, now it is measured and the data points lie uh, amazingly on the curve. So this is kind of disappointing. It was disappointing to us, uh, no new signal. Uh, but what we see is this extreme economy in the nature of the universe. It really obeys Einstein equations and the equations of uh, fluid dynamics and all of the standard physics we know to, to very high accuracy. So uh, that's the very large scale uh, structure of the universe. It's turned out to be amazingly simple and surprisingly simple. Um, no surprises uh, in large scale measurements of the universe. Now here are all the measurements on small scales. Uh, the most powerful microscope we have on Earth is the Large Hadron Collider, and it examines the structure of matter on uh, very short distances, much uh, smaller than an atomic nucleus. And uh, this is what it finds. Uh, the laws of physics are now well understood. Uh, the standard model has quarks, uh, leptons, uh, strong weak and electromagnetic forces, and uh, the Higgs boson. So essentially the only discovery at the Large Hadron Collider was the Higgs boson, uh, predicted 50 years ago. And uh, I'm fortunate to be the holder of the Higgs chair at, uh, at Edinburgh, and Peter Higgs is still alive, and I see him regularly. And as you can see, uh, his invention, the Higgs boson, is really at the heart of the standard model. But the disappointing thing is there's really nothing else. Uh, Large Hadron Collider has found nothing else. And so from my point of view, this is again an indication of extreme economy in nature. Nature has uh, gotten away with the standard model and apparently nothing else. Um, now I've included in the picture right-handed neutrinos. Uh, this is the simplest addition you can make to the standard model. It was made in the 1970s in order to explain the small uh, neutrino masses which are um, observed. In fact, uh, uh, mixing between different flavors of neutrinos is only allowed if you have very heavy right-handed neutrinos. And these right-handed neutrinos sort of fit in very naturally with the standard model, but the special thing about them is they don't couple to the forces. They have no electric, weak, or uh, strong charge. And so they're completely neutral. The only way they speak to the other particles is via the Higgs boson and of course uh, via gravity. So this picture was in place in the 1970s. Um, and uh, my claim in this lecture is that we don't need anything else. This, the, this picture alone I believe will be sufficient to explain the very large scale properties of the universe. And that's what I'm going to uh, tell you about in, in this talk. So the first uh, question is, what is the dark matter? Because normally people say you need another particle to be the dark matter. And I've said it myself in many lectures. I thought for a long time the only evidence for beyond standard model physics was the dark matter. But we recently realized that's not true that in fact one of the right-handed neutrinos is the perfect uh, dark matter candidate just because it, it doesn't couple to the uh, three forces. It only couples to gravity and the Higgs boson. And one can rather easily switch off the coupling to the Higgs boson with a, a Z2 symmetry, uh, in which case it becomes stable. And so this is actually the perfect dark matter candidate why did nobody propose it? Uh, so, so yeah, let me, let me explain a little bit more why they were introduced, uh, why right-handed neutrinos were introduced. If you have a left-handed neutrino coupling to the Higgs and a right-handed neutrino, and if the right-handed neutrino is very heavy, then as a left-handed neutrino moves along, it will oscillate via this coupling into a right-handed neutrino for a very short moment of time. The right-handed neutrino will have to be virtual, and if its mass is m, 
you will oscillate into this right-handed neutrino for on a time scale 1 over m. So very brief oscillation into a virtual right-handed neutrino, and then you're forced to oscillate back into a real um, uh, left-handed neutrino. So this is the seesaw mechanism, and you can see from it why neutrino masses are so small if the right-handed neutrino mass is very large, because this oscillation uh, take, hardly takes place. Um, so uh, how could the... Oh, sorry, let me also explain that if I switch off this coupling for one of the right-handed neutrinos, then uh, then it follows that, first of all, that the right-handed neutrino will be stable because there's no way for it to decay. And secondly, that one of the left-handed neutrinos will be exactly massless because one of these couplings is switched off. So this is the prediction. If the right-handed neutrino is the dark matter, if it is stable, it doesn't couple even to the Higgs boson, it only couples to gravity, and, and, it's, up, and it's stable. So uh, that's the most economical expl explanation for the dark matter. Now, why wasn't it proposed in the 1970s? And the reason is that because it's not coupled to standard model, model matter, it was never in thermal equilibrium. So nobody knew how to calculate its abundance. Um, it, it just doesn't couple to the hot plasma. So its abundance is arbitrary. And for this reason, people assume this is not true. They assume that it must couple and, uh, and therefore it must decay and it can't be the dark matter. But recently we realized how to calculate its abundance even if it is not in thermal equilibrium. And this is how you do it. You follow the universe to the Big Bang and then radiation dominated Big Bang, there's no inflation. And then what you realize is that the metric, the space-time metric, in the case that the universe is dominated by radiation, which has a traceless stress tensor, uh, in that case actually the metric is analytic in uh, what we call conformal time as we uh, even as we reach the singularity. And the metric goes like conformal time squared, and you can just continue it through the singularity out the other side. So we realized this in 2018, uh, and we realized this is an indication that actually the universe likes to be CPT symmetric. You know, time reversal symmetry is a very um, fundamental symmetry of nature, in quantum field theory, if you combine time reversal symmetry with parity and charge conjugation, this is an exact symmetry of any quantum field theory consistent with uh, relativity, or it's believed to be. And so we said, well, maybe the universe is actually CPT symmetric. Let's make a hypothesis that the universe does not break this symmetry uh, spontaneously. I mean, the, this is a symmetry of the laws, the quantum state of the universe can respect that symmetry or violate it. So we said, let's make the hypothesis that the universe is actually consistent with CPT symmetry. What does that mean? It means that the Big Bang uh, is a symmetry point, uh, time going to minus time, and it's a kind of mirror that the two sides of the universe are actually identical, but they're related by CPT symmetry. Um, so we made this hypothesis, and we discovered that we could solve the Dirac equation throughout this extended uh, universe. Uh, by the way, it's been known for a long time that there is a general class of solutions of the Einstein equations for um, matter with a traceless stress tensor, i.e. perfect radiation. There's a general class of solutions, analytic solutions of the Einstein equations, which have this property. There's a regular three geometry at the Big Bang. It's a conformal three geometry. Um, and you can, and, and the um, canonical momentum conjugate to the metric vanishes at the singularity. So the solution is actually symmetrical on the two sides. So this was known for a long time. 
but the significance wasn't appreciated. So what we are saying is that this symmetry is actually fundamental and it's a kind of selection rule that insisting that the universe is CPT symmetric forces you to these uh, special analytic solutions at the Big Bang. Within these solutions, we can calculate the number, the abundance of uh, right-handed neutrinos by solving the field equation for the neutrinos throughout this extended space-time, imposing CPT symmetry on the um, quantum state of the neutrinos in their vacuum. And uh, when you when you do this, you discover there's a finite density of neutrinos in uh, the asymptotic states of the universe. And essentially, they are produced as Hawking radiation from the Big Bang. So we calculated their abundance. We matched that to the dark to the dark matter density. And the mass of the right-handed neutrino is just a number. It turns out it's 5 times 10 to the 8 GeV. And, and that's the picture. It's a really very simple explanation of dark matter. But now it's more exciting because it makes a prediction that if one of the right-handed neutrinos is stable, then one of the left-handed neutrinos is massless. And this is about to be tested. So he here is a, a picture of the scale factor in conformal time. And uh, it's very interesting that with conformal matter, perfect radiation, the scale factor is linear in conformal time at uh, time zero. There's a simple zero. It's actually also very interesting that um, due to the lambda, the cosmological constant, the scale factor has a simple pole in our future. And so this blue curve is, is the universe we live in. We, and as I say, the solution is analytic here. And I'll come back to this, the importance of having an analytic solution to the universe in a moment. Uh, as we'll see, this will actually give us a Hawking temperature and the gravitational entropy. And this connects with ideas of holography, which are the topic of your conference. But just to come back to the neutrinos for a moment, um, we predict, you see here are the three neutrino masses. And what is measured are the differences between the mass squared, mass squares of the three neutrinos, um, uh, atmospheric neutrino measurements, solar neutrino measurements, fix two numbers. The third is not known, and we predict that the lightest neutrino is massless uh, in our theory. Because the other two numbers are known, we therefore predict the sum of the neutrino masses uh, to be 0 0.06 electron volts. And, uh, and here, are the, here are the current data. So we're predicting 0 0.06. Uh, Planck doesn't offer much constraint. But uh, as surveys are, are improving, you can see a bump is developing. And so what we predict is that over the next three years, three to five years, this bump is going to localize around 0 0.06. And the error bar, as the error bars get smaller, we will see exactly this value. If so, then the lightest neutrino is massless. And I would say that this explanation of the dark matter becomes uh, quite compelling. Uh, easily the simplest explanation. Uh, here's another uh, measurement. This is a future measurement from uh, LSST, uh, now just uh, beginning. And so here is the error bar on their measurement of this parameter, uh, mu. We predict um, 60 milli electron volts, and their error bar will be 12. So the 12 will be the width of this uh, hopefully Gaussian curve, which will eventually appear around here. So we have a clear prediction. There are other predictions. And, uh, and it will be really exciting to see what happens in the next couple of years. Now, just to go back to the Big Bang as a CPT mirror, and to emphasize that what we're proposing is really a kind of boundary condition at the Big Bang. So we live on one side of the Big Bang. But there is another side of the Big Bang, which is full of antimatter. And the entropy grows in the opposite uh, direction of time, it always grows away from the Big Bang. And uh, really, you can think of the other side of the Big Bang as just a mirror image 
uh, of our side and and say that we are implementing the CPT mirror by the method of images. Okay, so this is really very economical. We're not proposing a different pre-Big Bang universe. We're just saying that when we look at the Big Bang, actually um, it's a kind of mirror. Uh, this is the work, uh, old work, showing that this conformal three metric provides complete uh, Cauchy data for the full nonlinear Einstein equations at the at the Big Bang. Now, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the entropy of the universe. And the starting point for that discussion is the path integral. Uh, as you know, uh, the path integral is one of the fundamental tools we have in uh, fundamental physics, the most important tools. But uh, it's, a, it's a strange thing because uh, nobody really knows if this exists mathematically. Nobody knows if it's well-defined mathematically. You see, it, it says something really beautiful, which is that any amplitude in physics is really created by interference. The path integral, after all, is just a sum of phases, uh, e to the i phi. And uh, adding up all these phases, you get interference. And this is responsible for all of the strange effects in quantum mechanics uh, as compared to classical physics that the amplitudes are sums of phases and they can interfere destructively or constructively with each other. So here are all the known laws of physics. There's gravity, there are gauge fields, there are elementary particles, and the Higgs boson. So um, one question is when, you, uh, when you're studying cosmology, you know, what how many what what is the what how many what is the measure on the number of space times uh, this is a question which absolutely plagues inflation uh, you can ask um, how likely was inflation or how likely was a completely different initial condition for the universe and unfortunately uh, this is this is an achilles heel for the theory uh, there is no known measure for uh, geometries. But um, what I'm going to explain now is that we re recently discovered how to calculate a measure for geometries uh, of in cosmology. And the consequence of that calculation is that you don't need inflation. Okay, so uh, I'm going to, let me explain that a little, a little more. So we start from this formal path integral for gravity. And the way to get the partition function which is uh, a measure of uh, the sum, uh, which involves a sum over all states in the theory, um, you get the partition function by considering the path integral with periodic boundary conditions in imaginary time. Essentially, the time evolution operator, e to the minus i h t, uh, becomes the Boltzmann factor, e to the minus beta h. And, um, and then you trace over all states, which in fact means that you're using periodic boundary conditions in imaginary time. So the partition function formally is given by exactly the same path integral, but with different boundary conditions. And then this partition function in the case of gravity, so normally it would be e to the minus free energy over temperature, but for gravity, the Hamiltonian is zero uh, because of diffeomorphism invariance. So actually only the entropy term survives and the partition function is the exponential of the gravitational entropy. So it literally counts all states. Now, um, Penrose has uh, particularly emphasized this problem of trying to explain why the large scale geometry of the universe is so special. And so here's the creator putting the universe into this highly symmetric, uh, simple state that we now see. Uh, and for the, and because based on these considerations, Penrose was always a skeptic of inflation because he said it didn't really solve this problem. Uh, I want to give you a little bit of light entertainment before we go into the heavy mathematical machinery of gravitational entropy. And just remind you that we have a similar problem on Earth. How do we explain the flatness 
of, uh, of the earth. You see, in a local region of a few tens of kilometers across, we never worry about the curvature of the earth, uh, just because the earth is large. But in order to explain why the earth is locally flat, we need to explain why the earth is so round and smooth. Um, and um, one explanation would be that somebody made it that way. And this is really the analog of inflation. You've got some mechanism that flattens and smooths the surface of the earth, but that's, as we know, that's a bit ridiculous. Uh, a better explanation is just that the earth is large, about 10 to the 50 atoms. Uh, and then gravity pulls the matter inwards and so favors uh, a spherical configuration. But it's very important in addition, you have dissipation. So for example, if we had a spiky geometry here and one of the spikes fell over, it would not bounce back. Uh, when it fell over, the, the gravitational potential energy would dissipate as heat. There are vastly more ways to distribute that energy amongst uh, as uh, vibrations of the atoms which make up the earth, i.e. heat and sound. Vastly more ways to distribute the, uh, the energy that way. So entropy favors uh, the uh, Earth getting progressively more and more round. And that's why we believe the Earth is round. Um, in fact, it's very amusing that uh, a couple of years ago, people discovered evidence to support this, that, uh, that the major mountain ranges on Earth were formed just after the explosion of plankton in the oceans. Um, so the, uh, the early Earth atmosphere, of course, had a lot of carbon dioxide. But uh, when plankton arose in the oceans, they ate the carbon dioxide and uh, captured the carbon, settled to the bottom of the ocean floor and uh, were compressed into a layer of, uh, of carbon, which became graphite. And it turns out graphite is a wonderful lubricant. And so when continental plates collided, uh, in the presence of graphite, one plate will slide above another. And that's in fact uh, how these large mountain ranges formed, like the Rockies, the Andes, the, uh, the Himalayas. Uh, they formed by the collision of continental plates but the presence of graphite was critical. So actually this uh, evidence supports the idea that when you remove dissipation, um, the Earth's geometry, surface geometry, does indeed become more spiky. So how do we do the thermodynamic calculation for uh, space times and gravity? So this is the topic of black hole thermodynamics, of course, uh, there's been a lot of progress in this uh, due to holography uh, recently. Um, and what we've done recently is extend these calculations to cosmology. So uh, as you know, a black hole has a temperature, a Hawking temperature and a gravitational entropy. And the most elegant way to compute both of these things is actually just to use the trick I mentioned. You start from the path integral, you use boundary conditions which are periodic in imaginary time, and you literally calculate this partition function uh, to get the gravitational entropy. So that trick was shown to work both for black holes and for de Sitter spacetime. So de Sitter spacetime is a universe which only has a cosmological constant, uh, no matter or radiation. It's a highly symmetrical spacetime, which represents a bouncing uh, universe. Um, but uh, the way you calculate the gravitational entropy is you change from uh, global time, T, to uh, Euclidean time. Uh, so T becomes imaginary. Uh, Euclidean time is real. And then this metric becomes the metric on a four sphere. And it's easy to calculate the Einstein-Hilbert action for a four sphere, and that's the gravitational entropy. So um, this was also realized in the 70s that you could calculate the gravitational entropy for pure de Sitter spacetime. It's a very large number, uh, 10 to 122, 
and um, and so this indicates that gravitational entropy uh, is in fact very important in the universe today. So for comparison, the entropy due to uh, radiation in the universe, just the normal uh, sort of temperature cube times the volume, that's only about 10 to the 90. So this gravitational entropy is much bigger than the entropy due to the radiation. So strangely, this uh, calculation was not generalized to a realistic cosmology uh, until our work. And that's what we did uh, in the past year. Using this notion of conformal symmetry, so uh, the special nature of uh, singularities when the matter has a traceless stress tensor, and analyticity, meaning that there's a natural way to continue through these singularities. So I write the metric in this form as a scale factor um, with conformal time, co-moving space. And in the simplest case, we take the spatial metric just to be a symmetric space, either positively, negatively, or positively or negatively curved or, or flat. And uh, so that's our assumption about the metric uh, when we're doing um, uh, cosmology. We can study perturbations, uh, so gravitational waves or any other perturbations, as uh, small fluctuations around this metric. Um, and so uh, this is the statement that I mentioned before, that if the stress tensor is traceless, you can see from the Einstein equations that the Ricci scalar is zero, and just work it out for this metric, you'll discover that A of t goes like t at um, t equals zero. So there's a simple zero of the scale factor at time zero. Actually, we can see it from the Friedman equation. Here is the Friedman equation. Uh, dot denotes uh, d by dt. We have radiation, uh, matter, space curvature, and lambda. But as we go to a equals zero, you can see that a dot is a constant, so a goes like uh, t. So uh, in our paper, what uh, recent paper, we realized, uh, you know, this equation um, has analytic solutions. And strangely, these were not uh, seen before, not realized before. Now, it doesn't really matter for the purposes of, uh, let's say, practical cosmology. Everybody just uses a uh, computer code. But uh, if you find the analytic solution, you can continue it to imaginary time. And then you discover something remarkable, which is that the analytic solution to the Friedman equation uh, is also periodic in imaginary time uh, for all values of these four parameters. And so the universe has a Hawking temperature and a gravitational entropy. So we found the general exact solutions. They're, they're uh, Jacobi elliptic functions. They have remarkable analytic properties. We, and they determine the Hawking temperature and the gravitational entropy for a real uh, realistic universe. The way it works is that this function A of t is periodic in the complex time plane. So here's a solution starting at a big bang where a is zero, uh, real part of a is zero, and then continuing to future de Sitter infinity where there's a simple pole. And then this function is periodic in the complex plane. Uh, uh, it's doubly periodic, meaning it's periodic in the real direction, but also periodic in the imaginary direction. And that means that actually it lives on a torus you can identify the two sides of this rectangle, the, the opposite two sides in both directions. And, um, and so here's the function, it really lives on a torus. It has these poles and, uh, and there is a non-contractible loop around the torus. And if you calculate the Einstein-Hilbert action on this non-contractible loop, it gives you the gravitational entropy. And because the, the, everything is analytic, um, actually, you'll get the same answer for that entropy, no matter which loop you, you use, as long as it uh, can be deformed into uh, the class of loops, which can be deformed into each other, all give the same answer for the gravitational entropy. So it's a really very beautiful and fundamental property of the Einstein action and uh, field equations. 
So, um, uh, yeah, th this is essentially what the instanton looks like for a realistic universe. Uh, there's some compact space. Uh, we actually we assume space is either a three sphere if uh, the curvature is positive, or if it, the curvature is negative, we take it to be a compact uh, sub space of a three hyperboloid. Um, there exists an infinite number of discrete, uh, a discrete infinity of such compact subspaces. And we take, we, so we take space to be finite and compact. Uh, if, the, if the universe is flat, we take it to be a torus. Uh, and it turns out the answers do not depend much on the precise uh, topology of uh, the space at all. Um, uh, but we have the answers in all, all cases. Now then the big surprise is that this gravitational entropy actually favors a homogeneous isotropic and spatially flat universe. So a flat universe is the most likely universe and there's no need for any mechanism to make the universe flat. Uh, just like um, the gas in, in, in this room is smoothly distributed across space. Why? Because it, that maximizes the entropy. Uh, and so there's no need of any dynamics to explain why the air in the room doesn't all collect in one corner. Um, that's done by uh, entropy. And so uh, in exactly the same way, the most likely universe is a universe like ours. Uh, our explanation actually uh, greatly improves on inflation because it also shows that a small positive cosmological constant is favored uh, it turns out the entropy doesn't ex exist. There's no thermodynamic ensemble if the lambda is negative. And roughly speaking, the entropy goes inversely with lambda. And so the number of states gets larger and larger, the smaller lambda is. And we're still working on this, but uh, it looks like there will be a way to explain why the cosmological constant is small and positive within this framework. This is a recent article in Quantum Magazine. They made this beautiful picture. So what our calculation shows is that if you pick universes at random from some ensemble, you will most likely pick a universe uh, like ours. Now I want to move on to a different topic, um, which will end up explaining many things about uh, uh, the standard model and about the structure of the universe, the large scale fluctuations. So let's think about putting quantum fields uh, into cosmology, right? Uh, how, do you, how do you quantize a field uh, on, a, on a background space time? So as we know, uh, quantum fields have violent fluctuations in the vacuum. Uh, this picture is actually for QCD, but it's true for any quantum field theory. Um, and this means that the vacuum energy and pressure are divergent. Um, now there's something a bit shocking about this divergence. We're very used to uh, removing this divergence when, when we do quantum field theory, for example, by normal ordering operators or, or uh, renormalizing away the lambda. So there are tricks to remove it, but it's really very worrying. And I refer you to a nice discussion of Bryce DeWitt in uh, the 70s. Uh, he's one of the sort of deepest thinkers about this type of problem, about quantum fields in curved space-time. And he gives a very nice discussion. So imagine you do the following. When you calculate the vacuum energy, uh, or vacuum stress tensor, I should say, um, you know, in, for example, in Maxwell theory, it's quadratic in the field. And so uh, this operator, this quantum operator, uh, is divergent. Uh, it's a product of two quantum fields at the same point, and uh, th those things are divergent. So you need to regularize the, uh, the stress tensor. And the simplest regularization you can think of, which has some kind of physical meaning, is to point split. But you see then the point split, um, so you separate the two points at which, let's say, the field strength uh, tensor is calculated. The stress tensor goes like field strength squared. So separate the two points. If the two points are time-like separated, then you take the limit as the time-like separation goes to zero. 
what you're actually doing is smoothing over the energy. So the uncertainty in the time corresponds to a uncertainty in the energy. The closer you take the two points, the larger energies contribute. Okay, so you see the divergence. Uh, so this way of calculating is manifestly Lorentz invariant. But what you discover is that the expectation value of t mu nu goes like one over the time separation. This is the proper time separation in, uh, in the background Minkowski space-time. So just by dimensions, t mu nu goes like one over delta t to the fourth. And then you discover actually it looks like radiation. The divergence is traceless, uh, where um, yeah, delta t squared is this invariant time-like separation. So uh, that's OK. But the problem is this breaks Lorentz invariance. <laughs> These quantum fluctuations in the vac vacuum actually break Lorentz invariance. Now, you can renormalize them away, and this is normally done. But this leaves you very uh, unhappy, because gravity directly uh, responds to the stress tensor. And if you're throwing away such a violent infinity, you know what, what are you really doing? Well, even worse than this divergence are trace anomalies. You see, in this case, the trace is 0. But uh, you can calculate trace anomalies. They also are sensitive to divergences. And they have the property that um, you cannot renormalize them away. So these are well known in the standard model. There are trace anomalies. So the way they arise is you put the quantum fields in a curved spacetime, a fixed background spacetime. So there's a non-zero Riemann tensor in the background. And, um, and you calculate uh, t mu nu, you discover some answer that depends on the curvature of the of the background space-time. And so the divergences in the stress tensor, uh, even after renormalization, leave you with a trace which is, which is non-zero. And that means you've actually violated the fundamental symmetry of Maxwell and Dirac fields, which, which, which have conformal symmetry, and therefore classically have a traceless stress tensor. So there are troubling divergences in quantum fields. Now, recently we discovered something remarkable, which is that you can cancel all three, or all of these divergences in a rather simple way. So we're used to dimension one scalar fields, which have a two derivative action. But actually, it's possible to have dimension zero scalar fields with a four derivative action. You see, because there are four derivatives here, this is, you get box squared, uh, the length dimensions cancel with the d4x. And so phi has no uh, dimension. And, and actually, there is a uh, four derivative conformal invariant action. This is a very interesting theory. Uh, we recently found this, there's a long literature studying this theory going back to uh, Heisenberg. This theory is different than that theory because it has a infinite dimensional symmetry. If I shift the field phi by any harmonic function, the action is invariant. And this shift gives you Noether charges. Uh, so there are infinite number of conserved quantities. And it turns out when you analyze this theory carefully, as was done, for example, by Bogolyubov in the 80s, the only physical state is the vacuum. There are no particles in this theory. Uh, and, the, and so this is a really small change to the standard model. It just says, let's add something which basically deforms the vacuum, uh, but doesn't add any particles. So the vacuum fluctuations of these zero dimension zero fields are uh, by dimensions. Uh, you can't have any scale here, so d3k over k cubed. And the thing we noticed, and this has actually motivated our work initially on, the, on these fields, is this type of uh, spectrum is exactly what you need to explain what we see in cosmology, which is scale invariant uh, fluctuations on large scales. So this is the vacuum energy and the conformal anomalies in, the, in any quantum field theory. So these are just pure numbers, uh, integers. The vacuum energy you get 
uh, half h bar k for every massless dimension one scalar, minus two for a chiral fermion, plus two for a gauge field, and plus two for a dimension zero scalar. The trace anomaly is given by these expressions. These involve the Riemann tensor. Again, pure numbers. And then we discovered a kind of miracle, which is that given the standard model gauge group, which has 12 gauge bosons, eight plus three plus one, there is a unique solution in which all of these three uh, sums of integers are zero. And the unique solution is that the number of spin half particles is four times the number of spin one particles. In the standard model, that's 12. So there are 48 spin half fermions. And that's exactly right. There are three generations of particles. Each one has 16 uh, particles, if you include the right-handed neutrino. And so that matches perfectly. Uh, it only matches if the number of fundamental scalars uh, like the Higgs boson, is actually zero. And it's a bit ironic because I hold a Higgs chair, but what I'm saying is that the Higgs field is not a fundamental field. Uh, it's a composite field. And and actually that's, uh, that's very interesting because we know about the hierarchy problem that uh, there's a huge difference between the Planck scale and the weak scale. And so it, from that point of view, it's quite likely that the Higgs mechanism is something which, uh, you know, it's a, a, a low energy phenomenon. So that still has to be shown. But I think if you want to explain why there are three generations of fermions, and you're willing just to include the fermions and gauge fields in coupling to gravity, then this explanation, as far as I know, is easily the, the most uh, compelling explanation so far. According to this explanation, there are 36 of these dimension zero scalar fields. That number is fixed. Okay, so I'm going to end by telling you some very exciting recent work, and the paper I hope will be out this weekend, which is showing that the scale invariant fluctuation of the dimension zero fields indeed explains the scale invariant fluctuations we see on large scales in the universe. So the way it works is the following. You see, we included these dimension zero fields precisely to cancel the conformal anomalies in the standard model to make the standard model scale invariant. But that was at free field order. What about at one loop? Because when you introduce interactions, we know that couplings run in the standard model. And this gives you a trace anomaly. And so at high temperature, for example, this is the form of the anomaly. The, the quantum trace anomaly goes like temperature to the fourth, so scales similarly to the free field energy and pressure, but it's suppressed by alpha squared, where alpha is a uh, fine structure constant. And there are different coefficients here for U1, SU2, and SU3. Now, the point is that this trace anomaly can be canceled by coupling these dimension zero fields to the trace anomaly in the action. And uh, in fact, this mechanism of using a classical contribution to the effective action to cancel a quantum trace anomaly, th this mechanism is well known in string theory, which is a kind of 2D model of gravity. And there's a beautiful review uh, in the 80s of how you do this. Now, if you do that, you immediately have a contribution to the Einstein fluid equations, which involves phi. The Friedman equation looks like this, that instead of a dot squared is rho i to the fourth, you have this correction one plus c phi. Phi is scale invariant, and it follows that, um, that the scale factor of the universe or the conformal factor will uh, get scale invariant perturbations. Uh, you can translate this into the co-moving curvature perturbation. It's just a factor of a quarter. We've worked out the number, and amazingly, the amplitude of the observed large scale fluctuations is very close to the amplitude measured by Planck, just using the coupling constants in the standard model. Even more exciting, we just in the past few days realized that this mechanism gives a tilt, a small tilt. We're checking the numbers, so I'm not going to quote a number to you today, but you'll see it in the paper. And it looks like this number is 
is uh, correct as far as we can tell so far. So these fluctuations are adiabatic, Gaussian scalar. There are no primordial tensors, so no problem with that uh, limit I spoke at the beginning. And this is really very exciting. So to summarize, we uh, have a new picture of the Big Bang as a CPT mirror. We've got a formula for the gravitational entropy. Uh, these pictures explain the dark matter. They do explain the arrow of time. I haven't talked much about it. Uh, or at all about it. They explain the large-scale homogeneity, isotropy, and flatness of the universe. They tell us something about lambda. And then uh, when we cure the anomalies in the standard models coupling to gravity, we get all these other things, including explaining why there are three generations and why the perturbations have the right character. So just to emphasize, we haven't added any new particles, any new forces, or any new propagating degrees of freedom to the okay. standard model. These are encouraging so, yeah. signs, but that great remains talk. to be understood. So much. Uh, thank you very much for you listening. Much. You have some at time, but okay. I guess but you want to stop here. That was a great talk. So much. Thank you. Thank you. Have much. you have some at time, but okay. I guess you want to stop here. Uh, are there some questions? Uh, yes. No. I. I. I'd like to. I'd like to take questions if you. If you have them. Um. Well, I have one actually, just a naive question about this uh, dimension zero uh, action that you added. Um, well, I have one. Typically, actually, just a, uh, as far as I know, these theories about this uh, dimension zero, uh, but you are saying that there are no yes. to I didn't understand. Typically, so if I constantly uh, but you are saying that there are no so as I if I consider phi is uh, sorry sorry can you say so that again I yeah yeah exactly oh ghosts as I, if sorry I consider pi is yeah so it's a question about ghosts yeah yeah exactly yeah so so uh, there is a a large yeah. literature on these theories. Um, uh, much of it is kind of contradictory, <laughs> okay? Um, and typically people claim that higher derivative theories have problems with ghosts. Now, I think there is a slow realization that you mm -hmm. see, typically people have been trying to do things with this theory, yeah. which uh, it's not good at. <laughs> so the, the typical thing is to try to calculate an S matrix. Right, so how do you get an S matrix? Well, uh, the free theory is not very interesting for the S matrix. So people analyze, um, you know, introduce an interaction, something like phi to the fourth. Um, and then they discover that there's, um, uh, that the scattering is not unitary. Okay, so this does seem to be, you can't build, you can't build interactions in the same way uh, with these fields as you do uh, with the with the two derivative fields. Um, so that's a, a big focus of it. Now, but I think there's a growing realization that the free field theory actually makes uh, perfect sense. It's a conformal field theory. Uh, so there's now quite a large literature on, for example, uh, renormalization group flow uh, in theories with four derivatives like this. The Euclidean theory is absolutely fine. So there's no problem with Euclidean theory. And even the Lorentzian theory, if you don't include anything beyond quadratic, uh, this also looks fine. Okay, so um, I think the traditional arguments against uh, these fields are steadily uh, going away. I mean, it depends on the context. The, the other thing the, the other thing I want to say is that you know if you take such a theory and you actually ask what is the instability um, you know so, so just classically right solve this four derivative theory uh, it turns out the instability it, it, it essentially is that the field Phi goes linearly with time conformal time but in the context of cosmology this conformal time is is uh, finite and so the instability doesn't get very far anyway. Um, and so 
you know, so far our work is all in the context of quadratic interactions, but um, where there seems to be no problem at all. Um, and you can cancel the trace anomalies and all that with only quadratic interactions. When you go to higher order interactions, um, uh, I think it's very important to work in the context of cosmology where the conformal time is bounded. You know, it's not asymptotic states going from minus infinity to plus infinity. Uh, you're in this uh, finite universe. In fact, the Euclidean version of our universe is this torus, right? And and as far as we can see, the quantum field theory of this field makes perfectly perfect sense on that torus um, uh, because there's no disease in the Euclidean theory. And then you would have to analytically continue rather carefully. Uh, in fact, I should also mention that there's some nice work on Lee-Wick theory. So Lee-Wick theory is, is again a high derivative theory. Um, people have recently shown that by doing the analytic continuation from Euclidean to Lorentzian carefully, actually you can maintain uh, unitarity uh, even in theories with, with, uh, with these high derivatives. So this is definitely something still under discussion. Um, but, uh, Thank you. but as far as uh, we can see, are there any no, questions? Uh, you know, there's no obstacle to using such theories. Well, if there are no more questions, uh, I just are there any questions? Yes, there are some questions on chat box. Um, sorry. Uh, well, yeah, there are, are some questions. Uh, some questions in chat box. Okay. Well, uh, so I see a question there. Should I read it? There are some questions in chat box. Uh, so Sarah is asking, okay. could you explain again how inflation is not needed? What about reheating? I mean, how the flatness problem is addressed in this theory? I haven't explained it, but I can try to explain it. So let's start. So my claim is that every single problem you can, uh, you can, uh, which every single puzzle which inflation claims to solve is actually solved much more simply in this framework. Okay. So let's begin with flatness. Uh, why is it that, a that our calculation favors a spatially flat universe? Okay, and the intuition I can give you uh, is as follows. So when you're doing thermodynamics, it always depends on what you're fixing. Uh, you have to hold some quantities fixed, right? So for example, if I just say, which geometry is most likely? Uh, that's an ill-defined question, just the same way if I say, what's the most likely state of the molecules in this room? You have to tell me how many molecules there are. You have to tell me how much the total energy is. You have to tell me the conserved numbers, okay, in short. So what we have done is we fix certain conserved numbers for the universe. One is the radiation entropy, you know, because the expansion of the universe is adiabatic. So we fix the total entropy and radiation. This is, um, uh, this is a number which, which is conserved as long as the time variation of the metric is, is slow relative to the uh, frequency of the radiation. So, uh, so you fix that. You fix the total mass of the universe. Again, that's another conserved quantity. You fix the co-moving curvature scale, uh, and you fix the dark energy. So the, these are your fixed numbers. Given those fixed numbers, you compute what's the most likely geometry. Okay, and we claim that this instanton is the most probable Euclidean geometry under those constraints. So why does the flat universe turn out to be most probable? The reason is uh, that if the entropy is greater than this de Sitter entropy, I gave you this number, 10 to the 122. You see, that's the number for a universe without any radiation. 
as you add radiation, what you actually discover in the calculation is the entropy goes down, okay? More radiation gives you a smaller entropy. The reason is that this force sphere uh, actually shrinks in, uh, in size as you include radiation. So many people doing holography and de Sitter entropy took this as a sign that the highest entropy state is actually the empty universe. Now what we discovered in our calculation is that if you keep increasing the radiation entropy, you hit the Einstein static universe. The Einstein static universe is one where the repulsion of lambda is countered by the attraction of the radiation. It's a static universe. It has no horizons and no entropy. So the entropy goes to zero. If you continue beyond that, then you discover the torus. There's a topology change and you discover this torus. And the torus, the bigger you make the entropy, the larger the spatial extent. Essentially, you are pumping it up like a bicycle tube. And so this result I'm mentioning here is valid provided this entropy exceeds the gravitational entropy, the 10 to the 122. So, and it doesn't have to exceed it by much. If it's just bigger by a thousand, for example, then you discover the spatial curvature is um, 1% uh, of the, uh, curvature term is 1% of the right-hand side of the Einstein equation. So that's about where the current limits are. So basically to the extent that the universe is bigger than the Hubble radius due to lambda, uh, if it's just 10 times bigger, then the uh, most probable geometry has a curvature which is uh, only 1% in of the right hand side of the Friedman equation. So um, basically this new instanton has the property that the more stuff you put in the universe the flatter it gets. Um, and so it's just like the earth, you know, the, the more atoms you put in the earth the flatter would be the earth because the larger would be the earth. And so it's exactly analogous to that. Now it is a bit mysterious, I, I, I have to admit, because uh, gravitational entropy is still not really understood. We don't really understand uh, how to count the microstates of, uh, uh, this is only a, cl a semi-classical calculation and we don't, re you know, people are still really struggling with black holes to figure out what the gravitational entropy means. Uh, so, so I think this is, you know, a fascinating topic which certainly needs a lot more work. But uh, the, and the other sort of puzzling aspect of it is it's really the entropy of the whole space-time, right? From time zero to time to the future de Sitter boundary. Uh, it's, it's, an, it's, it's, it's essentially a non-equilibrium entropy. It's not like standard uh, thermodynamics. And, uh, you know, we still have to figure out what that means. But for me, this is uh, definitely a much more compelling uh, direction of research than inflation. Now I just want to take issue with the question where you said inflation explains reheating yeah. because uh, inflation doesn't explain yeah. reheating. In reheating is required by inflation because you started the universe with a high density of some hypothetical form of matter, you know, for no reason than you wanted to have that energy convert into radiation. So Inflation is built on a series of assumptions which have become traditional but actually have no fundamental justification. So uh, I would say the universe, you know, let me just say it simply, the universe is speaking to us, the universe is telling us, it's very simple. And we are busy build, building hor horribly complicated models which, uh, for which there essentially is no evidence. Uh, so, yes, you're right, I'm saying something very radical, um, but to me this is, uh, this is a, a very compelling uh, line of research. I think if it forces us to re-examine fundamental questions, you know, uh, that, that's really good and, and healthy for the field. So, 
Great. Uh, any other question? Great. Uh, any other question? Yeah. Can I can I ask one one more question if it is possible? Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. If I uh, remember correctly, uh, uh, Pangos's pro proposal about the entropy was basically um, I might be remembering wrong, but uh, the initial so initially the entropy was in the wild tensor and then later on in the Ricci tensor. So uh, is this uh, compatible with your suggestion or are they actually uh, two different things? Um, it's totally compatible. Um, let me... So, so I've been discussing with Penrose uh, recently, yeah. uh, several yeah. times. And Penrose, as you say, made this hypothesis that the vial curvature should be zero at initial singularities, yeah. but not at final singularities. And so he was trying to explain why the Big Bang is so different from the singularity at the inside a black hole. So he made this hypothesis. Yeah. Now, um, uh, our... Um, our work is, uh, let me see, yeah, what, what I would say is that our work implies his hypothesis, but actually an improved version of his hypothesis, okay? Uh, so I'll explain why. So in the 90s, there was a postdoc working with Penrose who refined Penrose's hypothesis as follows. Also, Paul Todd was important in this idea. They said, look, why set the wild curvature to zero? Let's instead say that the universe was conformal to a regular 4D metric. So the universe is omega squared, the metric, Einstein frame metric is omega squared g mu nu, but the g mu nu there is a regular metric without any singularity. And what's special about the Big Bang is that the omega, the conformal factor, is zero on a space-like three surface, but it has an analytic zero. So omega simply vanishes on some space-like three surface. So that was the hypothesis replacing Penrose with this idea of a conformal zero. Um, now, if under that assumption, uh, Newman showed that the general solution of the Einstein uh, fluid equations um, for that general solution, the conformal three metric provides complete Cauchy data at the bang. Okay, so this is more or less rigorously proven using nonlinear uh, GR. Very nice papers. However, I said that actually our hypothesis implies Penrose's improved hypothesis. You see, sorry, it, it, in what Newman did, the vial curvature would be regular at the bang, not uh, zero, but regular, but finite. The vial tensor with one index up and three down would be finite. Okay, there would be a coordinate system in which the vial, vial curvature is finite. So that was the improved hypothesis. Now actually, our idea that the universe is CPTC symmetric, I, believe, I now believe implies Penrose's improved hypothesis. Why do I say that? So one should study the path integral for gravity with CPT symmetric boundary conditions. So what, the state on the left and the state on the right have to be mirror images of each other under CPT. And now you try to see, are there any classical solutions which are saddle points of such a path integral? Now, if they're classical solutions, they need to solve the field equations. and uh, that is only guaranteed if they are analytic. Okay, so the statement is there are a class of classical solutions which are analytic throughout the space-time, therefore saddle points of the path integral, uh, and they have this property that the sigma 3 is a regular conformal 3 geometry, also the extrinsic curvature is zero on this uh, special initial surface, if you like. Mm -hmm. So there is a class of solutions which do. Now, there are infinite class of classical solutions which don't 
solve the Einstein equations at the singularity. That class includes BKL chaos. Um, it includes, uh, you know, all the Kasner metrics. Uh, and then my claim is that if we do the gravitational path integral properly, all those singular solutions are just going to cancel out by interference. I mean, they are legitimate paths. You can glue them together at the bang, but they do not solve the field equations, right? And they are not analytic. And therefore, what I believe will happen is interference will just cause them to cancel. So uh, I believe that the CPT symmetry actually implies Penrose. Uh, I, I should say that I'm trying to persuade him. Uh, and, and so far I haven't managed because he, he changed tracks, you know, uh, whatever. I was studying the cyclic universe in the 2000s and Penrose switched to the cyclic universe. Yeah. And now I'm trying to trying to persuade him that he should switch back to the vial curvature because I think that's a much more economical explanation. So Penrose is Pen, what Penrose is doing now is essentially trying to glue this surface, the future infinity, to the the Big yeah. Bang. So he wants yeah. one side of this picture with a huge conformal distortion and and unfortunately he doesn't have any equations to take you from here to there uh, whereas what we're doing is extremely economical only using the Einstein equations and uh, so it, it's far more minimal um, but but indeed these ideas are very closely related yeah thanks for the well, question it, it was actually well, great talk. it was actually great there is a lot of food for talk. Thank you so much um, are there any more questions? We still have some time. Okay, Professor Truk, thank you again. Um, now, thank you so much. Now we can now we can now move to the next speaker. The next speaker. Okay. Uh, oh, let me see. Oh, let me see. Are you?